Good morning. Let's stand to our feet. Let's worship our God together. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah. So 
like our God. Amen. Come on, there's no God like our God. Amen. Amen. He does wonders. He is powerful. He's merciful. He's loving. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for each person that's here. Father, we ask that you will just reveal yourself to us this morning. Father, that you will show us that you are great above anything that we're going through, dealing with, feeling. Father, that all is in your hands. We ask that you will move in a mighty way. Holy Spirit, take over our hearts in this service. We give you all the praise and all the glory. No name is above the name of our God. He reigns and rules with all power and authority. In Jesus' name. Come on, shout amen, church. Who else can lead us, lead us to freedom? No one, no one, no one. And who else can heal all our sins and diseases? No one, no one, no one. And who else can walk, walk on the water? No one, no one, no one. And who else can answer, answer by fire? No one, no one, no one. And who else can bring down the tallest of giants? No one, no one, no one. And who else can silence the roar?
but I can't get past what I'm hearing the Lord say in the spirit this morning that that there are people in this room that a miracle, your miracle is one step in front of you. But you're you're sitting back and you're you're like spectating and you're just watching and you're just kind of observing. But the Lord's saying there's your miracle is one step in front of you. And God honors faith. Like it's not gonna happen if you don't take a step of faith. You don't walk on water if you don't step out of the boat. And so I just want to encourage you. With, with, I'm going to ask him to sing this again. But if whatever you're facing, listen, these aren't just empty words. We're not just giving lip service on Sunday. This is true. And he's a powerful God. He can heal your body. He can mend broken relationships. Listen, he can open up doors for you. He can do the impossible. But, but it requires a step of faith on your part. It requires a step to say, I believe, Lord. Even if you need to help my unbelief, but I believe, God. I believe you can do it. I believe you will do it. And so we're going to sing this again, and I want to just challenge you this morning. If that's you, if you're, if you're believing God, if you're needing God for provision, for a miracle, for a breakthrough in your life, I want to challenge you to take a step. Maybe literally take a step out of your seat. Maybe come down to these altars and, and thank Him and worship Him for what He's made available to you by faith. Take a step this morning and receive and step into what the God of breakthrough has for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is too hard. His arm is not too short that he can't reach and save wherever you're at this morning. We're going to sing it again. And I encourage you, take a step of faith. And let's see if God doesn't do something miraculous in our midst this morning. Come on, let's sing it again. Take a step if you need God to move.
sing once more worthy 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 lord forever forever worthy 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 lord another glimpse of glory we'll see Just as a, an act of faith on our part, if, I know there's many who are believing God for miracles. You've asked God for things. But I wonder if we could just, for about five seconds, just step out and give the Lord a hand clap, a shout, the biggest praise that you could offer in faith. Even if you don't see it with your eyes yet, you're declaring that it will be done. It will.
the Lord will fill and flood your people. God, that there will be a smile on our face. Lord, that we will be filled with confidence and joy and hope once again, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give God a shout of praise one more time. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't you high five about three people. Tell them God is faithful as you find your seat this morning. I feel like we need a testimony. Miss, uh, Miss Kim, Miss Kim, would you mind sharing? I'm just throwing this on her like right here in the moment. But I just feel like another testimony would just be so encouraging. Let me come down there to where you are. Uh, this is Miss Kim Anderson. Would you mind just encouraging us here a little bit? Well, I sure would. Uh, my testimony is like so many. It starts in pain. And I moved here to Athens about six years ago. And that's when I started attending New Covenant. And uh, then we got uh, COVID. And then I got cancer. So many people have. Uh, and during that time, I, about this time last year, had surgery to remove it. And I went home to recuperate, and as I was laying in bed in the privacy of my own home, I felt like I was dying. And then in the next minute, I knew I was dying. And I praise God. I have lived a long life. And I laid, and I just was so joyful, and I waited, and I prayed. But the next thing I knew, I was laying at the foot of my front door. And there were emergency vehicles picking me up to taking me to the hospital where they performed emergency surgery on me to remove a very a large amount of blood clot from my chest, around my heart and my lungs. They didn't think I'd survive. They were surprised I did, and I was too. And I will tell you, I was so ready, and I still am thinking, why didn't God take me? I was ready. And then I'm thinking, was I prepared? And so I joined with Blake. He opened up a Bible study. And we did a kind of a deep dive into a couple of things. He asked me what my relationship was with God. And I said, I've been a lover of and a follower of God all my life. And he asked me, but what is the block between you and God? And I immediately experienced conviction. And I said, well, I have lived a life of isolation in fear and anger and I have not even seen my family in 30 years. So I guess you can see I'm not as prepared to go home to Jesus as I thought I was. <laughs> so I did a little bit of soul searching, a little bit of prayer. We did a deep dive into a wonderful uh, story, uh, chemo brain, of when the king opened up his party, the bridal party to everybody since nobody came, and he came upon a man that wasn't prepared. He wasn't dressed appropriately, and he cast him out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And at the end of that Bible study that we did in that parable, it tells us that so many, many are invited, but few are chosen. And I thought, oh, oh God, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to see that I am not prepared. And so he gave me the opportunity to live, to be convicted, to speak out my sin, to confess it out loud, repent. And now I'm starting to do what I have not done all my life. And that is I've started to travel to see my family. Yes. Not yes. easy. <laughs> Thank you. Re relationships are so important. But if you see me and I'm so full of joy, it's because he's taken away my fear. Yes. He's taken away my anger. Yes. And he's taken away my need to isolate. Yes, yes Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. And so I just want to say that the next stage, the next testimony is coming up because now I have to renew those relationships and step into that next thing, which Pastor David has told us to do. Let's get busy. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Kennedy. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank God. Wow, that's powerful. Wow. Thank you so much for sh sharing and on the spur of the moment as well. Um, wow, that's so encouraging. One, that uh, you see the power of being in groups and, 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 and growing and studying God's Word together. I see also in her story, uh, maybe for some who, you know, haven't, well, we've got a few years under our belt that uh, God is not done with you. Amen. If you're still here, then he's still got a purpose for you and he's got work for you to do. And so thank you so much, Miss Kim, for sharing your story. That was powerful. Well, let's, uh, let's go to the word. If you got your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke chapter 14 with me. Luke 14. We're in a series called The King and the Kingdom. And uh, I think this will probably be the last sermon, the last message in uh, this series. Uh, we, we've been dealing with how to, how to understand all of these things that Jesus taught. First of all, that the gospel is not just the personal salvation message of Jesus sacrifice for us on the cross, but it is what he talks so much about, which is the kingdom of heaven. And so that's what we've been trying to dive into to the end that, that, that we could see what he was trying to show us and that we could live out what it means to bring the kingdom as he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's what we've been trying to establish and, and move forward in is bringing the kingdom, understanding not only who the king is, but what his kingdom is like and all about. And so to begin, I'm going to just tell you a little personal story. Uh, I graduated from high school. I went to uh, college at a little college called Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College in Tifton, Georgia. Yeah, maybe I've got a few ABAC alumni. I was going to school there, away from home. Uh, when, I, when I moved, uh, so one of the things that I leveraged as a poor, broke college student was I, I could play the piano and keyboards. So I got a job playing at a restaurant on Friday and Saturday night, and then I got a job as a church musician. So I was, I was, I mean, I was making good money uh, as a musician, Friday nights, Saturday nights, and then, of course, uh, on Sunday morning, they were paying me to play in a, a pretty large church there, and so that was great. Uh, the president of the school attended our church, and so uh, Dr. Harold Lloyd was his name, and he caught me on campus one day, and he said, uh, he said, David, I've got a, if you'll come by my office, I've got two tickets I'll give you. We're doing, a, we're doing an alumni fundraiser, and I've got two tickets. You can come, and, you know, if you've got a girl on campus you're trying to impress, we'll, we'll bring her. This is a black tie affair, so you need to wear a suit. Of course, freshman in college, away from home, the last thing I want to do is put on a suit, and he's offering. He said, come by my office, pick up these tickets. They're yours. I'll give them to you. You can come to this event, and uh, Roger Williams is going to be uh, the guest musician. I didn't know who Roger Williams was. I mean, he's a little bit before my time. Uh, we didn't have a Google then, so I couldn't Google him. I didn't know. I didn't have a clue. I was clueless. And furthermore, so I grew up in the woods and hunting and fishing, so at that point in my college career, I was not really established, didn't know a lot of people there. All I, all I was doing was going to school during the week, and then I was racing home on the weekend so I could get in the woods and hunt the Muggy River swamps and, and do what I love doing. And so I just said no. I was like, thanks, but appreciate it, but no thanks. And Dr. Lloyd kind of gave me this really dumbfounded look like, are you kidding me? Well, I come to find out that these tickets were worth $200 a piece. Uh, Roger Miller was actually kind of a big deal. And I had just turned down like an idiot a wonderful opportunity that had just been handed to me. And the whole reason I turned it down is because I didn't know what I was being offered. 
I didn't understand the value of what was being given to me. I mean, freely given to me. And I turned it down simply because I didn't understand the value of it. And I tell that story because in Luke 14, Jesus tells a parable that illustrates the same story. He says this, starting with verse 16. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another one said, I just got married. We had a great wedding in here yesterday. I don't think they're here, but I'm glad they're not here. They shouldn't be here. I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Ms. Kim, this is the story you were referring to just a moment ago. And the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. And I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste at my banquet. Would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your word. It is truth, unchanging. It is settled, established. So would you reveal your word on our hearts so that it would set things straight that are not right, that it would make crooked places straight, that it would make dry places flourish with living water once again. Holy Spirit, come in and reveal Jesus to us in a fresh and new and exciting way this morning. We trust you for it in his name, the strong son of God. And let the church say amen. amen. So I told you that story and just read that parable about the kingdom simply to begin with today. I feel like we've not always done a good job or done the best job at, at bringing the kingdom, at talking about Jesus and, and talking about what the kingdom is. I think sometimes the church tragically becomes known for what we're more for what we're against than what we're for. And, and we get so caught up in like rules and, and guidelines and expectations that we don't really talk about the freedoms and the liberties and the joy that we've been given in Christ. And so I think it's one of the first things I want to say is like, you know, when we, when we give an invitation to someone to come to the banquet, we need to make sure we understand that we're communicating the value of what we're offering to them, that they understand fully what the value of this ticket is. And, and the best way to do that is to talk about what Jesus has done for you. To talk about the, the freedom that Jesus has brought in your life. To talk about the deliverance that he's brought in and established in your life. To talk about the joy that has come into your life since you found Jesus. And so I think it's, it's so important. So, so many times we've, I feel like we've done a poor job of not, of not sharing and telling and, and, and communicating the value of the kingdom of God that we have when we talk to other people who are not part of the kingdom. Like it's, it's, no, it's no accomplishment. It's, you get no traction being condemning, being judgy toward people. Talk about the goodness of God. Talk about the joy that he's brought to your heart. Talk about the liberties that you have in Christ. Talk about the freedom that you have. Talk about the miracles that you've seen God do. Talk about the, the prayers that have been answered in your life. Talk about the salvation that God has wrought in your family. Talk about the good things of God and make sure that people understand the value of the ticket that you're offering them. Amen? If we show people the peace that we have, the joy that we have the, the fulfillment that we've had in Christ, then I guarantee you they'll want to be a part of this kingdom that we get the privilege of, of enjoying. Amen? Amen? Tell people the value of it, and they, they will come. Don't be judgy. Don't be hating on them. Let's just, let's just say, hey, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. 
where I used to be and where I am now, it's like night and day. He's brought me a mighty long way. And he could do the same for you. Make sure they understand the value. And then they might say yes. You come at them with a pointy finger and a long nose and condemning words, they're, they're not coming. But make sure they understand the value. So that's just an introduction. Um, I want to talk really about Jesus uh, talked to us and taught us um, many truths about the kingdom. And some of these truths are, let's say, paradoxical in nature. Like they, he says one thing and it seems to be in conflict to a reality that we understand. And so I thought today, well, let's just explore some of these paradoxes that Jesus taught in, in when he was teaching us about what the kingdom of heaven is like. Remember these parables I said last week, it's like Jesus is holding up a diamond in the sunlight and, and he's just, he's turning it. And every time he turns it and he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this and it's like this and it's like this. And he's, he's showing us all of these different facets, these truths, these realities of the kingdom of God, which has come and is coming. It's been inaugurated, but it will culminate as well. And so some of these truths are, are obvious and don't have to be explained, but, but some of them are paradoxical in nature. And one of the reasons for that is because we're, we're dealing with two realities. We're dealing with the reality that we know and live in and understand. Our, our senses pick up on it. We see the, the physical realm that we live in. But the kingdom of God is a spiritual reality that we can't see yet. And so sometimes when Jesus talked about the, the spiritual realm the, of the reality of the kingdom of God, we kind of have to, you know, we kind of have to imagine it. We have, we have to understand it. We have to kind of go there in our mind's eye and picture it. And sometimes when we, when we understand that reality, it, it butts heads and comes in conflict with the reality that we see around us in the physical realm with our eyes. And so this is a, called a paradox. Everybody know what a paradox is? Okay. Paradox, let me just give you a definition real quick. It's a, a paradox is a logically self-contradictory statement that when investigated or explained, it may prove to be well-founded and true. So some examples of a paradox just in, in, in common everyday language. You might have heard this. Somebody will say, Somebody may have, you've heard somebody say, less is more. That's a paradox. Have you heard that? Less is more. That's a paradoxical statement. Uh, here's one. The only constant is change. That's a paradox. Holy war. Paradox. Uh, maybe you've heard this one. You have to spend money to make money. You heard that one before? Yeah, paradox. I like this one. This is one of my favorites. The only rule is there are no rules. That's one of my favorite paradoxes. I love that one. The only rule is that there are no rules. But let's go in and dive into some of the statements Jesus made that are paradoxical in nature about the reality of the kingdom. Because once again, the kingdom is in the spiritual realm. We live in the physical realm. And sometimes those things come in conflict. The first one is this. And I think they're going to put it up on the screen. We've already mentioned this one, but the paradox of the kingdom is this. It is already, but not yet. The kingdom of God is already, but not yet. Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. So the scripture tells us that, that, that God through his son Jesus has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. Yes, we have been rescued. However, there are times when we look around and based on our experience, we can say, but there's still darkness, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I've encountered some darkness every now and then. I bump up against it in this cursed, sinful world. We're going to still bump up against darkness, even though the scripture plainly tells us he's rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. What's going on? It's a paradox. Are we rescued from it? Yes. But do we contend with it still? Yes. Until he returns and establishes his kingdom of light and destroys all darkness, the paradox is the kingdom has come already, but not yet 
in its fullness. Jesus inaugurated it on the cross, but he will culminate it upon his return. That's why it's a paradox. So don't, don't let your heart be troubled. Amen? Amen. You've been rescued, but you will contend with it as well. And if you will contend with it with a, with a spirit of faith, you will have victory. Amen. But you will contend with it. But if you'll contend with it in faith, you will have victory. Why, why, can, why can I say you're going to have victory? Because you've already been rescued from the kingdom of darkness. So there's a, there's a tension there. It's a paradox. Here's another one Jesus taught. This comes, well, Paul says this, and this is one that people bump up against. In Romans 10, 13, Paul said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, I love that one at a good altar call. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. However, Matthew 7, Jesus said this, in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. What? Wait a minute. Paul said, everyone who calls on the name, Jesus said, but not everyone. Is it everyone or is it not everyone? There's a paradox happening right here. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, listen, this is incredible. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Didn't we perform miracles? It's amazing. And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What's going on here? There's a paradox. Becoming citizens of the kingdom of heaven isn't just responding to a sales pitch for Jesus to ease our guilty conscience in a quick moment in time and then never really change, never really make him Lord of our life. Some people get confused like, well, I said, I raised my hand, I said the prayer, I checked the card. No, did you make him Lord? Because yes, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but not everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. You've got to make him Lord of your life. It's not just a, a relief of your conscience at the end of a church service during an altar call. It's making him Lord and Savior of your life. So that's the reality of the kingdom. Remember what we said. This is a monarchy. He is the king. He makes the decisions. He calls the shots. He establishes right and wrong, not us. We are citizens. He is the king. We bow the knee to the king of kings. And so there's a paradox of between true obedience and, and empty confessions. It's not good enough to just have an empty confession because of a guilt-ridden conscience in a moment. It's true obedience. Whoever does the will of my Father is the mark. Here's another one. Jesus taught in Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Isn't that so confusing? Whoever, whoever finds their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life will find it. It's a paradox of the kingdom. Psychologists tell us, and through research have confirmed that hedonism, the, the, the pursuit of pleasure, and uh, the, the viewing your life with you at the center, at the pinnacle, and pursuing everything that provides pleasure to yourself, hedonism. Psychologists tell us that, that there is no difference between hedonism and anxiety, that they run parallel at increasing rates. The more hedonistic you are, the more anxious-ridden you will become. They run along parallel tracks. The more we think about ourselves, the more we consider ourselves, the more we, the more we line our lives up with us, at the center, then the more anxious our lives are going to become. Uh, and I got to be honest, I detest this common phrase that goes around in our culture. It's such a hedonistic phrase. I'm living my best life. I hate that phrase. I can't stand it. Just live your best life. Yeah, do whatever you want. I'm living my best life. 
the reason I hate it is because it's exactly the opposite of what Christ taught. We're not in this to live. If our goal and our pursuit is for us to be as happy as we possibly can be, then we're going to lose our life. But if we'll lose our life, if we'll give ourselves and lose ourselves to the purposes of God and the people around us, then Jesus promised, then you will find fulfillment in what true living is all about. So it's a paradox. It's, the paradox is the difference between purpose and pleasure. You're living for purpose or you're living for pleasure? You're living for pleasure, you're going to lose it. But if you're living for purpose, you're going to find true life and fulfillment. Another one is this. In Matthew 18, Jesus said, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, and, he, and they asked, Who then is the, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Don't we all want to know that? Like, who, who's going to be at the top? Who's going to be sitting beside the king? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then, so Jesus shocked them all. He called a little child to him, and he placed the child among them. Jesus is so disruptive. Uh, he placed a child among them, and he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, who takes the lowly position of this child is actually the greatest in the kingdom of of heaven. You see that it's flipped upside down. Our, our, our natural, our physical world tells us greatness is defined by wealth and fame and popularity and power, success, achievement. Those are the greats. But in the kingdom, it's actually the weakest, the youngest, the children, those who can't fend and fight and speak for themselves. They are actually the greatest citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Christianity has historically held to this truth, this conviction. And now, now medical science is, I think, catching up and verifying the viability of the fetus living in the womb of a mother. That it's not a parasite, but it is a human being. And according, furthermore, according to Jesus, those are actually the greatest citizens in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? The unborn children living in the wombs of mothers are some of the greatest citizens of the kingdom of our God. Just let that settle for a moment. It's greatness. That's greatness. It's not pretense, not privilege, not position, not experience. Greatness lies in children. Here's another one, Matthew 20, verse 16. He tells a story leading up to this statement about an owner of a vineyard. He says this man owned a vineyard, and he hired some tenant farmers, and the farmers worked the vineyard, planting, reaping, tending, doing all that is required for the grapevines, and then the time for harvest season came, and so he sent some of his servants to the vineyard to help gather the harvest, to help reap some of his investment. Well, when he sent servants, the tenant farmers killed the servants. Obviously, they wanted to keep all of the fruit of their hard-earned labor for themselves and not acknowledge the owner of the vineyard, so they killed the servants. So the owner of the vineyard, then he says, well, they killed my servants. I'll send my son. Certainly, they'll, they'll recognize and they'll honor and respect my son. They, he sends his son, and the tenant farmers do the same thing. They kill the vineyard owner's son. So he tells this story about the vineyard owner and the tenant farmers, and then he says this. He says, the last will be first, and the first will be last. He says, in this story, he goes, in the morning, this, this vineyard owner, he hired some workers to come. He said, I'm, I'm just going to hire people to come and tend my vineyard. So in the morning, he hired workers, and they started working. And then about lunchtime, he hired some workers. And they showed up around lunch and started working. And then in the evening, about time to, 
About time to call it a day, he, he hired another crew, and they showed up in the evening, and they started working. And when it came time to cut checks, he gave everybody the same amount of money. Those who had been working all day, those who had been working from lunch on, and those who showed up about quitting time, he gave them all the same amount of money. Isn't that upsetting to you? Uh, doesn't that, just, that just really disturbs our sensibilities of fairness. Can I tell you, fairness is not a, a biblical trait. It's not, an, it's not an element of the kingdom. God never has, has strived to be fair with us. But he's always gracious. And so there's a, there's a tension in this idea that the last will be first and the first will be last. And it is that those of us who maybe we, we had the blessing of growing up in church and had a Christian mom and dad and we came to salvation early on in our life and we've served Christ and we've avoided all the pitfalls of sin and we've been faithful, we've been good church kids growing up, we did it right, we, we towed the line our whole life. You get, the, you get the reward of heaven. But guess what? The person who has lived for themselves and done terrible, horrible acts, committed atrocities and lived destructive, divisive life, has been in prison and out of prison, has, has destroyed the lives of everyone around them in the last moments of their dying breath and they call out in an honest way to God and their soul is rescued from the fires of hell, they too receive the same reward and are given the gift of the kingdom of heaven. The first will be last and the last will be first. It's not fair, and God never intended it to be fair because he's gracious. And the paradox is it's equal grace, but it's not equal fairness. It's equal grace. Matthew 21, 43 says this, and this will be the last one. We'll close with this one. 21, 43 in Matthew says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. I think one of the most important things we can understand about the kingdom of God is that God is not impressed. He's not. He doesn't. Um, he's not attracted to how many followers we have on social media. He's not impressed with how we look or our accomplishments. Like in, in, the, in our physical reality, all of these things are like measuring comparison uh, blocks for us. You know, it's like we, we look at each other, we measure each other up, we compare and we say, okay. And we, we, we create a pecking order in our mind. He's here, I'm here, or maybe I'm here and he's down here. And we, we create this pecking order, but that does not exist in the kingdom of heaven. There, and this is, this is hard sometimes, but there are no pedigrees in heaven. Doesn't care how many generations deep you run that your father, grandfather, grandfather were preachers. Like in, in the kingdom, it doesn't matter. God doesn't give a rip. It doesn't matter how good you look. It doesn't matter how successful you are. It doesn't matter how many followers you have on social. Like all these pretensions that we carry around and, you know, and gloat about and, you know, we don't do it. We act like we don't do it, but we do it. We kind of got this twisted thing that we're going on where we, 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 this false humility, like we don't do it, but we do it and because we know that it builds us up. But that does not even exist in the kingdom of heaven. There's no privilege. There's no pedigree. There's no pretense in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is simply this. Whoever produces the fruit of the kingdom belongs in the kingdom. That's it. Jesus don't care how many followers you have on social media. He don't care how pretty you are. He don't care how handsome you are, how many times you go to the gym. He don't care if you're the president or the CEO or, or you've been at the bottom of the total poles the, the whole time you've been at the company. He does not give a rip. All he cares about is are you producing the fruit of the kingdom? He will give the kingdom to a people who will produce its fruit. 
That's so powerful. That's so, uh, it's, it's so equalizing and opportunistic for all of us that we have the opportunity to produce the fruit of the kingdom wherever we're at in our life. And so as we roll this out and we've been teaching on this, I just want to charge you, New Covenant. Let's bring the kingdom and let's produce the fruit of the kingdom. Amen? Like these, these ideas for pop-ups, we're going to run with this, and I hope we do a lot of them, and we show up in our community, and we just love on people, pray with people, bring the kingdom to our community who desperately needs it. I hope you'll participate as many times as you can when we announce it. Sign up, participate, go, hand stuff out, love on people. But listen, that's not it. It's not just what we organize and create as a church that you can do. You can bring the kingdom on your own. Christ admonishes you to. You can, you can do it on your own. You can, you can prayer walk around your neighborhood. Just start going on a walk around your neighborhood and pray. Just praying for your neighbors, targeting each house. I pray, I bless, I lift up, God. I intercede for that house and that house and that family and those kids and, and for that person sitting on the I pray and I lift up and I intercede for my neighbors. Furthermore, maybe, maybe a step beyond praying would be maybe, uh, maybe learn their names and then use their names. Might be a novel idea. This segmented society we live in. Learn some folks' names and call them by their name to their face and to God. Pray. Bring the kingdom. Maybe, maybe as you're praying for your neighbors, you know, our God's an interactive God. Like He's not going to let you talk to him and him not talk back. He's going to talk back to you. Here's an idea. Maybe, maybe you're praying for your neighbors and the Holy Spirit speaks a word to you for them. Maybe you write that down on a card and just stick it in their front door or the mailbox and they find it later. It's bringing the kingdom right where you live into your neighborhood. Maybe there's a coworker that's struggling. Maybe they're the person that always struggles. You know that person. They always got something going, always drama follows them like a cloud. And that's fine. But you know, maybe instead of giving them the same treatment, the cold shoulder, the roll of the eyes, maybe change it up. Maybe bring the kingdom. Maybe instead of doing that, you, you take them to lunch. And you say, look, I'm going to pray for you. Over this lunch that we're sharing and we're enjoying, I'm going to pray for you. And we're going to call on the power of God and all of the armies of heaven. And I'm going to pray and we're going to, we're going to see breakthrough. I am tired of sitting and listening to you gripe and moan every day at work. <laughs> we're going to see breakthrough in this. Amen. And you bring the kingdom. A cold shoulder and the roll of the eyes isn't going to cut it but maybe a lunch and a prayer over lunch. Now that's bringing the kingdom. You can do this. You can bring the kingdom. Invite people over to your house for a cookout or for dinner. Fellowship around the table. Or if that's weird or too much, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. My house? Like in, inside my house? I don't even know those people. Okay. Maybe when you're cooking out, take something, you know, across the property line and just offer it to them. So here, we're cooking out. Thought you might want some. Bless you. What's your name? We haven't even met yet. We've been living here for 10 years. <laughs> Bring the kingdom where you live. Here's one. I've done this, and it's so, it's so much fun. Keep a $100 bill in your pocket. Just take 100 Whenever you get paid, I mean, you can do this. At Starbucks, this is just a few coffees, and you got it. Just, just fast a few coffees and you'll have it. Just keep a hundred dollar bill in your pocket, and then just listen to the Holy Spirit. I promise you, He will tell you what to do with it. But when He speaks, you need to have it, and if you have it when He speaks, and you do what He says to do with it, man, you're gonna have the most fun with that one hundred dollar bill than you'll have in your life. Way much more fun than if you buy something for yourself. Just keep it in your pocket and then listen to the Holy Spirit. 
and you're going to have a blast and you'll bring the kingdom. Bring the kingdom. We used to do this when, of course, our kids are grown now. It's hard to, it's hard to swallow, but when our kids were smaller and we lived in the neighborhood, Indy and I decided and on, the, on, the, on the most wicked holiday of the year, we would order pizzas, cook a bunch of soup, hot cocoa, and we would set it up in our driveway. And I mean the whole neighborhood and the, it got to where the surrounding neighborhoods would all come. And we had this huge Halloween bash. All these people and their kids would show up. I mean, kids are out trick-or-treating, but, but they would come and congregate at our house. What is that? Why do we, what is the point? We bring in the kingdom. Because we were able to not just serve a bunch of food and have fellowship on that night, but we had so many conversations with people. Families that were raising kids, struggling, wondering, you know, Decisions that needed to be made. We're able to talk and pray and just fellowship with people. That's, that, that's bringing the kingdom. And so I, I guess that's what I want to challenge you with, church, is let's just work on bringing the kingdom right where we live. The joy, the peace, the fellowship, the community that the kingdom of heaven has, God said for us to pray and do, thy kingdom come here now on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Would you stand to your feet this morning? Amen. I just want to close with a prayer and a blessing over you. Would you just close your eyes right where you are? And let me just bless you with this prayer. Father, I bless everyone in this room in Jesus' name. Everyone in this room who's following after Jesus, who trusts in him and his, as, his Lord, as their Lord and Savior, we're all ambassadors. We're ambassadors of that heavenly city. We're here, but we're from there. So God, help us to see ourselves that way, ambassadors, representatives of another country. And while we're here, God, would you shield us, protect us? Would you be a fence around our minds so that the mindset of our culture doesn't get in on us, but that we affect the culture with the heaven's mindset? That we would be good, strong, true ambassadors of the kingdom. That as we live here in this place, just for a short while, show us, speak to us, teach us how we can bring the kingdom into our homes, in our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, into our schools, into our communities. Show us how we can be ambassadors of heaven and bring the kingdom to the earth. You said this, that if we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, then all that we need in life, all that we can ask for will be provided to us. So God, we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and we trust you with the rest. In Jesus' mighty name. Would you raise your hands and with your palms up? I just want to bless you before we close this morning. In the name of Jesus, I speak this blessing from Philippians 1, 2. May the blessings of divine grace and supernatural peace that flow from God our Father and our Messiah, the Lord Jesus, be upon your life, the life of your spouse, the life of your children, and your children's children. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. We're going to close with a song, and it will be dismissed.